Welcome back to Coteries in New York. Last time, we met the Scourge, and it went about as well as meeting the Scourge ever does. Now it's time to end the night. One of these days I'm gonna think to do that before ending the video. Hmm, what's this? Hmm. Yeah, I don't think my voice is up to, uh, to more rasping. So sure, let's go with this one. The street lights filter into the apartment in a stark white glow, as if someone were shooting a movie outside. The art pieces display a tasteful expense, entirely fitting the image you have of you have of Sophie. It feels as if a thousand sins have been committed on these premises. Most of the most of them under her benevolent hospitality. Sophie comes to greet you as you enter the living room, shaking her head. You understand that people judge me based on how you Oh, I see. You understand that people judge me based on how you dress, don't you? Sophie looks at your clothes as if resigned to your sartorial limitations. I have no idea what that word means. I can take care of myself. You don't have to fuss over me, Sophie. I can take care of myself. Good God, Kiryu from fucking Yakuza has better fashion sense than you. I'm sure you can, little fledgling. Sophie walks to the window and looks out, the streetlights playing on her features. She reminds you of a queen contemplating the unfortunate limitations of her subjects. You'd think that as a vampire, we l at least we wouldn't have to worry about the vultures of the press. Unfortunately, when you have power and ability, there are always parasites trying to feed on you. Hmm. Yeah, let's just go with this one. Is there a reporter after you? Yeah, it's a terribly persistent creature. Sophie steps away from the window and settles down on a sofa, a wine glass with red liquid in it, blood treated as not to spoil. You've become good at noticing the scent, even from a distance. She doesn't offer you any if you cautiously sit down across from her. This awful man has been stalking my apartment with a camera. He's gone through my trash, talked to the neighbors. Please be a dear and explain to him that there's nothing for him here. Is this about the masquerade? That's a big deal for us, right? Indeed, you are learning. This must happen often. How do you usually deal with it? Everyone has their own way. Sometimes the problem, sometimes the problem goes away with a bit of money or sharp words. Other times, you need something more. Do you know anything about the reporter? About this reporter? Why bother changing that one word? Man, woman, young, old, anything like that? All gossip reporters look the same to me. Time for you to go. I have business to attend to. You leave the apartment as Sophie disappears into another room. You don't have a clear idea of the game she plays with the city's mortal and immortal power structures but she always seems to be making a move. Outside on the street, there's a slight warm drizzle, the kind that gets under your clothes and makes you want to take a shower when you get back to your own haven. No reporters immediately jump out to you. Mm, let's go with this one. For a while, it feels like nothing is happening in the, in the New York night. People are walking past you on their way to whatever nightlife diversions can help them forget their sordid lives. As you contemplate going back inside and telling Sophie you are not looking for a new career as a lookout, you suddenly notice the lens of a camera pointed at you across the street. Hey! <coughs> hey! You yell and run across the street. It's a man you're sure you've seen somewhere before. Rotund, pasty, someone who spent too much time in badly ventilated rooms stained with cigarette smoke. You enter an alley, a dark, dingy space between two tall buildings. Once upon a time, a place like this might have worried you, made you think of muggings and violence. Now it's clear that the most dangerous thing here is you. The man you're following seems to realize this too. He holds his camera in front of him like a shield. It's heavy objective. It's heavy objective. I, I, I don't get it. Resting on his paunch. 
With a start, you recognize him. You remember the face, the shaded sunglasses from a picture next to a byline in some trashy paper you were reading to kill time. Something about celebrities, scandals, sex. His name is Frank Doherty. You saw him on the street one time, with a camera outside a nightclub. Probably waiting for someone important to come out so he could take their picture. Something about this guy looks familiar. Hey, don't go scaring people like that. Welcome to Knuckle Town, fat man. Let's make this fun for at least one of us. Whoa, whoa, I'm a reporter. Huh. A lot of scoops here in this dirty alley. You can't be a journalist if you're not willing to get your hands dirty. You live here? I'm working on a story about a local resident named Sophie Langley. Everybody knows her in high society circles. She's a redhead, pretty as a picture. There were a lot of pictures of her through the years. That's the thing. That's the thing of that. Look at this. Frank pulls out his phone and starts showing you pictures. Some have been downloaded from news sites, while others are photos from the society pages of newspapers from past decades. All show Sophie. She has different clothes, hairstyles, makeup, names, but the face remains the same. So you're a stalker of some sort? Come on, I'm just doing my job. You must have a theory. <laughs> So, why does this matter? Yeah, let's go with that one. Maybe it doesn't matter, but people are always interested in staying young. Three words. Extreme plastic surgery. All celebrities do it. Only a doctor is better than the rest. You look critically at the photos on Frank's phone. You're looking for a doctor in an alley. You're thinking the world's best plastic surgeon is working out of this alley. Okay, fine. I'll know what this is about. Now, how would you explain it? You gotta understand that I know Sophie pretty well. We move in the same circles. Frank looks at you skeptically. But what can you tell me about it? She's very entitled, terrible towards service workers, flips from one young handsome guy to the next. Girls, too. Oh, she's bisexual and an asshole. Who cares? They all are. I gotta have something usable. <laughs> Apparently we're still glitching out. Once again, I don't have Dominate. So let's use Dominate. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, that, that one's only available to the Ventru of the, of, of, of the choosable plants. You look Frank in the eyes. They are red behind his shaded glasses. Veins pop from years of neglecting his body. Suddenly, he seems soft, easy to manipulate, his will nothing but plaster crumbling under your boot. Go home and destroy your research on Sophie Langley. As your vampiric gaze takes over Frank's mind, he feels less than a person and more like an automaton, a machine you can program. Perhaps this is why older vampires are said to think of humans as nothing but animals. How can you consider something a th someone a thinking person with free will when you can override them at any moment? Frank is mumbling, fondling his camera, inching around you to the entrance of the alley. He looks sad and worn as he goes. A man who used to be something, now just a shell. It feels almost embarrassing to use the powers of your blood on someone so weak. At least you're pretty sure he'll stay away. Oop, start. I, I, th I think I'm starting to see a tiny bit of red creeping around the edges. I don't know, maybe that's just because of the map. Uh, I guess we're moving on to something else now. Uh, well, let's go talk to Agathon. I know I should probably meet the others at some point, but I mean, might as well get the most obviously powerful out of the way. You know what to expect when you return to the small bookstore serving as Agathon's haven. The cacophony of occult imagery assaults you from the book covers displayed on the window. But under the fake facade, there's something real. This time, the Buddhas and satanic Bibles of the storefront seem almost funny. Nor perhaps you've just started to tune into the dry humor of these, Tremere. Just as you're about to ring the doorbell, the door opens and Agathon storms, storms out. You step aside just in time to avoid having him stumble into you. Lawful Stoop, what are you doing here? I don't remember the voice I did for this guy either. I wonder if there's a trend to this LP. Window shopping. I'm 
window shopping for books that could be <laughs> that would help me understand the wicked beast I've become. Agathon looks at you and sighs. Please, no jokes. I don't have the energy to deal with your attempts at humor. Attempts? Ow. Agathon walks to his car with you in tow. It didn't occur to you the last time the last time, but it's a surprisingly pedestrian vehicle. An aging, mid-sized family sedan. You imagine what it would look like with a baby seat in the back. Opening the door on the driver's side, Agathon notices your look. Laugh all you want, but it's inconspicuous and practical. Why not just get a Prius? You sit in the car, and Agathon starts driving in his usual, careful style. At least you'll never be stopped by traffic cops. It seems Agathon is not interested in small talk. You decide it's best to let Agathon drive in peace. Agathon is very comfortable driving in silence. You look out you look out the window, wondering at the ordinary lives of the people you pass by. Suddenly, Agathon snaps you out of your reverie. Let me ask you something, Lawful Stu. Do you enjoy the hunt? Yes. Of course, I thought all Kindred did. I mean, maybe I feel guilty sometimes, but it's a rush. Not all Kindred enjoy it, but you're right. Most do. There's something melancholy, I think that should be melancholic, in Agathon's voice that you can't quite parse. You exit Manhattan over the Brooklyn Bridge and soon reach the site of the nightclub that seems to be your destination. It's on the riverfront, a converted former warehouse. From the start, you recognize the place. Apparently Agathon is telling me this. With a start, you recognize the place, the club where fate latched its cold, grubby hands onto your soul. You wanted to party, but instead you became a monster. How's that for a hangover? <laughs> I don't- I'm just saying, I don't remember this happening before the update. Did I just not notice it? <laughs> After Agathon has parked the car, it's time for you to enter the nightclub. You glance at the Tremere, evaluating him. It's obvious this is not his kind of place. Good chance the research notes are here. Let's go! But let's not waste any time. Excellent. There's a line to the club. It looks like a popular night, even if based on the crowd, this is not exactly a place for supermodels and celebrities. You walk up to the man at the door and smile. Ah, there it is! Getting hungry. Hey, you remember me, right? Mind if we go in? The bouncer looks at you, taken in by your supernatural charisma. It doesn't matter whether he really remembers you or not. Sure, go right in. Have a great night. You walk into the club, ignoring all the people standing in line. The music beats down on you, bringing with it memories of, the, of a human existence. The first time you went dancing with friends. Ah, oh, shit, I just remembered this place. I'm gonna have to put up another warning. When you flirted with someone on the dance floor. This time, it's different. You're a predator, and everyone around you is prey. Tightly packed, twitching sacks of blood and tissue. You sense the emotions all around you. Blood tinted with happiness, lust, rage, jealousy, love. Buffet of sensations. Focus. Keep an eye out for trouble while I look for what we came, came to find. You nod and follow Agathon through the throng, trying to ignore all the warmth, flesh, and circulating blood around you. Well, we are kind of hungry, but he did say to help us, <laughs> to help him. And we can wait. Eyes on the ball. You came here to help Agathon, and that's what you'll do. Agathon wades through the dancing people purposefully, yet you have no idea how he searches for the missing research notes. Perhaps he's using the enhanced senses of a vampire or some esoteric sorcery. At least he seems to know what he's doing. Both of those are, uh, are, are options for the Tremere. Do you know? You swerve to avoid a drunken man who, has just, who was just about to spill his beer onto you and try to see what Agathon is looking at. A young woman, intense, purposeful, a little out of place at the nightclub, just like you and Agathon. Who's Juno? She's Tremere, a renegade. Bad news. What? Uh-oh. The woman, Juno, elbows a drunken man out of, out of her way and points a finger at Agathon's face. Agathon, you traitor. Don't you dare stand between me and what's mine. You look at the woman in surprise. Her appearance stands in contrast with the anger in her words. You know, you know Isling won't let you leave with the notes. Perhaps she won't let you leave at all. Juno 
Rachel pulls close to Agathon's face and stage whispers loudly enough for you to hear her over the music. You're still so brainwashed, you care about... You care about what Isley fucking Sturbridge wants. I've done jumping through her hoops. I don't know what... I don't know what I saw in you, Agathon. You're such a lapdog. Okay, quick thing here. Um, I mentioned that all the Tremere are bloodbound to the Pyramid. Well, the Tremere clan weakness is, um... No, for the way blood bonds work is that there's three stages. Um, at, at, at a third stage blood bond, you are completely enslaved to the will of whoever you're blood bound to. To the point you actually can't have any other blood bonds. The Tremere, automatically, every time they, every time they ingest the blood of another vampire, jump up two stages. So if they, if they were completely unbound, they start at stage two. If they drop down to stage one and have another drink, they're up to stage three. It's bad. You're automatically bloodbound one stage to your to your sire. So yeah, he probably is just completely fucking like entranced by her and anything she has to say at any given moment, without her really needing to put in any effort to make it so. Look, are we sure we want to talk about all this in the middle of a dance floor? Do I look like I care about the fucking masquerade? You look at, Ju you look at Juno in genuine shock. From Sophie, you've understood that the masquerade is universal among the kindred. Yeah, uh, the Anarchs want nothing to do with the Camarilla and its laws. Even they obey the masquerade without question. Pretty much the only ones that flout it are the Sabbat. And look at what that got them! Juno? You don't mean that. You're not suicidal. Fucking watch me! Juno, please. Juno steps back, suddenly cold, ignoring the people all around her. She stares hard at Agathon. The past is past. The traditions are dead to me. You won't stop me, Agathon. I'll make sure of that here and now. You know I have the power. No, Juno, please. Agathon sounds panicked. He's not worried about his own survival, but of the possibility that Juno is going to unleash a genuine masquerade breach. Gotta stop her somehow. Calling on the powers of the blood, you step close to Juno, between her and Agathon. Agathon was being an asshole. Don't hurt yourself just to get at him. He's not worth it. Juno looks at you in the eyes, and you can see that she's tired and scared. Defecting from the Tremere is not easy or safe. It's suicidally dangerous, yeah. Like, more than any other thing that you could possibly, like, leave, leaving the Tremere is, like, a death sentence. The hell? Is, is that some kind of creepy blood doll? Not like a blood doll, but th that thing in the in, in the screen off to the left a little bit. How long has that been there? Freaking me out. You're right. She turns to go, then stops and glances back at you. You pick your friends better. With that, Juno walks through the oblivious of dancers towards the exit. Looking around, you realize that Agathon didn't stay to witness your exchange with Juno. Instead, he worked his way around the dancing crowd, looking for the notes using his arcane methods. After Juno is gone, he returns, shaking his head. The notes were here, but they're not anymore. It's possible someone had, had them when they hunted here. After making sure Juno is nowhere to be seen, to be seen, comma, you and Agathon push your way outside. Outside, you walk to Agathon's car and drive back over the Brooklyn Bridge to Manhattan, heading for Agathon's haven. Juno mentioned some things that are personal. I trust your discretion in not talking about those things to Isling. Of course! But your love life is your business. Thank you. After a while, you reach Agathon's haven and he parks the car. You walk to the occult bookstore and Agathon asks you inside. One sec. Ah, something up with my ear. The smell of incense assaults you as before, making you grateful not to have to breathe. You follow Agathon upstairs to find Isling Sturbridge in an, in an armchair reading an old book. She puts a bookmark in place as you come in. You were successful, I hope? No, I'm sorry. The notes had been there, but not anymore. That's a shame. I hope you won't run out of time. How did Sophie's little protege do? Agathon turns to look at you. Well, surprisingly well. That's a surprise. 
I'll have to give Sophie a compliment on her choice. And that's Juno. Fortunately, she hasn't found the notes either. That's interesting. The High Regent turns to look at you. What was your impression of Juno, Fledgling? <laughs> it defaults to betray Agathon! <laughs> <sighs> she was very angry. I don't know what you people did to her, but she's pissed. What, what we did? Careful now, Fledgling. She made her own choices, bad as they were. Anyway, I have some things to discuss with Agathon. Go along now. You leave the occult bookstore, the cheesy, mystical music still in your ears as you walk away. You wonder about what happened with Juno. Why is she so anxious to leave her clan? Did she really do that? What the fuck was that? Could you leave Sophie's service if you wanted to? The answer is probably not. And that's where we're gonna cut it here. Actually made some pretty good progress today. If you like this video, please like, comment, subscribe, share with your friends, blah, 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 blah. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to see you again next time. And I hit the wrong key.